Our text this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice and guile, insincerity, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion's stone a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness and into the marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and exiles to abstain from the desires of the flesh that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that Though they malign you as evildoers, they may see your honorable deeds and glorify God when he comes to judge. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. And let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, be with us this day. May we hear your word and may we live your word out in this world. Amen. A group of professional people posed this question to four to eight-year-olds. The question was, what does love mean? And here are my favorite answers from that poll. Love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other. (laughs) Love is when you go out to eat and give everybody most of, and give somebody most of your french fries without making them give any of yours. Love is what makes you smile when you're tired. Love is what is in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and listen. Love is when you tell a boy that you like a shirt and then he wears it every day. Love is when mommy gives daddy the best piece of chicken. Love is when your puppy licks your face even after you left him alone all day. I know my older sister loves me because she gives me all of her old clothes and then she has to go out and buy new ones. God could have said magic words to make the nails fall off the cross, but he didn't. That's love. We could also say that love is a little baby born in a manger. When Christians think of love, it is God's love that immediately comes to mind. In fact, during this time of Advent, as we begin each worship service with the lighting of the candles, (coughs) the words that we hear each Sunday talk about hope and peace, and joy, and love. Maybe that is what makes Christmas so special. Encased in the frenzy and stress, enclosed in the gifts and presents, wrapped up in the family and traditions, coated in the worship and meaning, is that which brings it all together. Christmas is a time of hope, and peace, joy, and love. I picked an unusual text for this third sermon in Advent. I did not take leave of my senses, I promise. But today is the third Sunday in Advent, and we're talking about joy. And yet, I chose a text from 1 Peter that was written to Christians to address what happened when Christian persecution was becoming common practice. There was a time when Christians had little to fear from the Roman government. In the early days, it was not easy to tell the Jews and the Christians apart from one another. For some time, the Romans considered the Christians a Jewish sect and therefore did not cause them harm. 
the change came in the days of Emperor Nero. According to the legend, when a great fire destroyed Rome, Nero blamed the devastation on the Christian community, initiating the empire's first persecution against the Christians. Modern scholars debate whether or not Nero made Christians his own scapegoats. But what is certain that under his rule, the cruelest forms of torture were inflicted upon innocent Christian people. I will spare you the gory details, but new ways of killing were developed. Edicts and laws were passed that made it officially unlawful to be a Christian. And as a result, people who followed Christ were in danger and they feared for their life. Peter, in this letter, tried to give a message of faith. I've often wondered what Peter could have said, what comfort could he have offered? Would it have been better if in these pages in his letter he said, don't worry, it's always darkest before the dawn. Or I know it looks bad, but it's all part of God's plan. Or look at it this way, how could it possibly get any worse? Those suffering in the name of Christ during that time did not need to hear cliches and platitudes. What they needed in their life was hope and peace and joy and love. One of my commentaries summarizes this by saying, First Peter urges Christians to take a different attitude toward their suffering. Christian character is not developed by living under conditions of ease and comfort. It is only by meeting difficult situations and conquering them that one becomes spiritually strong. In our verses for today, Peter instructs Christians on how to live despite difficult and dangerous times. They are to rid themselves of all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, and envy. And just as newborns need milk to grow and thrive, so should the person of God find nourishment in God's word. Peter tells them to rely on the cornerstone that is Christ and that they are to remember that they are God's people and they have received mercy. Now, to me, whether it's Advent or not, that is a good, strong message for us Christians today. Live without malice. Do not be, don't do bad things in thought, word, or deed. Live as one who feeds on God's word. Live by relying on Christ. Live as God's merciful people. Keeping these commandments goes a long way to a blessed life. And whatever is happening in the world, in our nation, in Ohio, in Poland, in our own lives, know that God is with all of us. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to minimize or trivialize anything that anyone endures. But I am trying to say that in Christ, no matter what else is happening, we have hope, peace, joy, and love. We had it in a time when Christians' very lives were at stake. We had it throughout history. We have it now as we prepare and wait for that child of Christmas. And we will always have it, that hope, peace, joy, and love of Christ. It's important for me to use this scripture today in Advent because Peter understood this concept all too well. And he says something in verse 7 that leaps off the page. He says something that's a, it's a shot in the arm, it's a confidence booster, it's a calming presence in the middle of a raging storm. He says eight simple words. To you then who believe, he is precious. Those words are important for us today as they were then. To you then who believe, Jesus is precious. What does that mean? How, how is Jesus precious? How does that help us? Well, first of all, Jesus is precious because he lives. That was the faith that Peter gave to these Christians to give them courage to face death, to give them hope in continuing to live. Jesus is precious, not because he lived, not because he died, not because he led a good life, not because he was an example. He is precious because he is alive forever. The resurrection of Jesus is mentioned 108 times in the New Testament. In the book of Acts, there is not a sermon preached without mention of the resurrection. And this message from Peter is crucial because it gives all of us hope, and it is coming from an expert. 
who better to substantiate the truth of the fact of the risen Christ than the Apostle Peter? Peter had been one of the twelve. Peter knew Jesus as well as anyone. Peter had seen the empty tomb. He had met the risen Savior. He had witnessed the Lord's ascension. He had received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he'd been preaching to thousands and thousands of men and women. Peter knew better than anyone that Jesus is precious. As Christians, we are not excused. We are not exempt from the harshness of life. That means that we go through what everyone else goes through. We worry. We, we find loneliness and illness and death and betrayal and lack of trust and broken relationships. Whatever the circumstance that we go through, we can always count on the presence of Christ. Christ who experienced every human disappointment, every hurt, and every torment. Jesus will never leave or forsake us. And he said, be assured I am with you always. Believe that and you will believe that Jesus is precious. We have the comfort and blessings to know that we can go to our Lord who is precious because he lives. He's also precious because he forgives. We all know that the hardest person to forgive is often ourselves. I don't know about you, but I'm constantly thinking about things and having regrets about what happened in the past. And that's what makes the Christian message so important. Jesus Christ can and will forgive us and set us free from whatever is affecting our peace of mind. Now, there's a story about Leonardo da Vinci when he painted the Last Supper. Uh, there, th th this, again, internet things... I choose to believe it's true. I can quote the site if you would like me to. But the legend goes something like this. When Leonardo painted The Last Supper, he knew a fellow painter, and the two of them were bitter enemies, his, his rival, his mortal foe. They despised each other. And when da Vinci painted the face of Judas at the table with Jesus, he used the face of his enemy as a model. So, And he did it so that it would be present for years to come so that when they saw that face they would think of the betrayal of Jesus very clever when you think about it he took delight while painting the picture knowing that others would actually notice the face of his enemy on Judas and as he worked on the faces of the other disciples he often tried to paint the face of Jesus but he couldn't the harder he tried to paint Jesus, the more frustrated and confused he became until he finally realized what the problem was. His hatred of the other painter was holding him back from finishing the face of Jesus. Only after making peace with his fellow painter and repainting the face was he able to paint the face of Christ and complete his masterpiece. When we know that it's time to forgive, we forgive. And God helps us do that. God helps us do that in many ways, and we see these examples throughout our lives. But we also, again, see that example in the Apostle Peter. There was a complete transformation of Peter's own life because Jesus forgave Peter and set him free. Peter, who had denied his Lord three times. Peter, who had let the pressures of the common crowd decide how he should act and behave. Jesus is precious because he forgives us. He sets us free to love in a right relationship with God. And Jesus is precious because he loves. The people to whom Peter wrote were living in a callous world. And we all know that human life can be a strange mixture of love and pain, of sunshine and shadow. Peter reminds those Christians and us of the loving concern of Jesus. The love of Jesus that is so amazing, so powerful, so freeing, so divine, that despite our own sins and shortcomings, despite our faults and failings, Jesus still loves us with that love that will never let us go. There is a story about Karl Barth. Uh, Karl Barth was a 20th century theologian, wrote hundreds of books, taught wherever he went, was very influential in his day, 
and known as a very great theologian and person of God. And this again is a legend of a story, but when he was at Rockefeller Chapel in 1962, he was at the University of Chicago during this tour. And after the lecture, during the question and answer time, a student asked Barth if he could summarize his whole life's work in theology in a single sentence. And allegedly Barth said, I can, I can do it from the words that my mother taught me in a song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. The love of Jesus for you and me is at the very core of the gospel. And our Lord showed us that there is no limit of his love when he went to the cross. And he confirms his love daily by his offer to help us right here, right now, by giving us that living presence in our lives. As we learn from the article in which the 48-year-olds gave what they thought love was about, the one defined love as God could have said magic words to make the nails fall from the cross, but he didn't. That's love. My final story this morning is about a, is about a, a, a physician's assistant who was working in a big doctor's office. And a man came in because he had fallen and he had, a, he had hurt his hand and he was in today to have his stitches taken out. And he sat down and, and this uh, medical assistant took his vitals and got him ready for the doctor come in, to come in and see him. And the man kept doing this as we do, as you all do when I preach, doing this, <laughs> looking at his watch, obviously preoccupied with another destination to where he needed to be. And though the, the medical assistant felt terrible because she knew he was going to be here a long time, probably an hour, maybe even two, because it was the kind of day that it was shaping out. And he sat down and she says, well, let me take a look at your hand before the doctor comes in. And he said, thank you. Um, I am in a hurry. I have an appointment that I do not want to miss that I cannot be late for. And, and this girl felt sorry for the man. So she said just a minute and she, she went to the doctors and she told them that his hand looks good and the, the cursory thing was good. Could she just go ahead and, and, and dress the wound? So they said yes and she came out and she goes, you know what, I'll just take your stitches out and then you can be on your way. And as she's working on the wound, he keeps doing this and she says, Do you, are you late for something? Do you have some place else you need to be? I, I keep seeing you. I, I keep noticing that you're checking your watch. And he said, I have an appointment. I have a lunch appointment with my wife, and I just don't want to be late. And so the lady was trying to make conversation and get the man on his way. And she said, well, does your wife get mad at you if you're late? Or uh, is, is it going to turn out not to be a good lunch? If you're late, and the man smiled at her, and he said, My dear, my wife is in an Alzheimer's ward. She doesn't know her own name, and she doesn't even recognize me. And she said, And not only do you want to be on time, but you still go and visit her. He says, I visit her every day. She doesn't know me anymore, but I know her, and I want to be with her every minute of every day. And that's a great story. It's not where it ends. The young women choke back tears all days thinking of a love like that, hoping that one day she would be with someone that would love her that much. And you know exactly where I'm going. God loves us that much. God sends his son to us that much in a time of preparing, in a time of hoping, in a time of waiting, in a time where every day, if we trust God and work at it, we can have hope and peace and joy and love. And we can do that because Jesus lives, Jesus forgives, and Jesus loves. Let us pray. Gracious God, be with us this day. Help us as we prepare for that blessed day coming very soon when we enter in with the Christ child and have our hearts full of hope, peace, joy, and love. Be with us now and always. Amen.